Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Turn to Numbers chapter 32. I said um, earlier, maybe yesterday, uh, what this homecoming represented uh, to me was just seeing you people and you being here has been the blessing that I needed. I have never been, um, I've never tried to present myself in a way that where I would appear holy, self-righteous, above everybody. The people who know me best know that I've made mistakes in my life. I've committed sins in the ministry. And those are hard to deal with because then the devil tells you you're not qualified, you're not fit, you need to get out. Things like that. And so when I preach... I always try to convey the idea that the message, whatever it is, has already been preached to me. And that I can only give you what God has done in me and done for me. In Numbers chapter 32... I've been preaching here for the last few Sundays about love, love for God, love your neighbor as yourself, how to love others, how to forgive others, and, and so on. And, and it's been, and you know, it's been some emotion in that, some of my own emotion in that. Um, you know, I want to love people. And I, and I truly mean this. I want this church to be a hospital for sick, wounded hurting, damaged people, including the people whose wounds are self-inflicted. There isn't a one of us that is righteous, no, not one. And we've had people who have been making phone calls To people in this church, including people who don't attend here, who are part of this church online, I found out that they've been making phone calls to people out watching us on the internet. Saying things like, Bethel isn't what you think it is. Bethel, people at Bethel, they did this and they did that and... They're, they're doing this, and they're doing this, and this is bad. And here's what I'm going to say to that. Part of it's right. There's people in this church that have done some bad things. I'm not going to deny it. But I'm not going to turn my back on sinners I would be the hypocrite if I did Numbers chapter 32 so here's the message that I need to hear we need to hear in verse 20 um, what had happened was they haven't crossed Jordan yet they were going to and I can't remember who it was that um, the children of Gad, children of Reuben, they had found some land on the west side of Jordan and they said, can we, can we have this land before you go into Canaan? And, and God said, Moses, tell them they can have it. And what those tribes said was, we know that you're going to go across Jordan and you're going to go and you're going to fight wars now for the rest of the land that God's given us. 
And here's our promise. We promise that even though we have already have our land, we promise that we will go with you and we will fight for you. We'll be there for you. We're not trying to get out of the wars. We're going to commit ourselves to going with you and fighting with you. And so that was the agreement in place. And so here's what, here's what was said in verse 20. Moses said unto them, if you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. So that's the setup for verse 23, which is a verse that I'm sure you're familiar with. Verse 23 says, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Father in heaven, I ask for your help to preach this message. I don't know how to do it. I'm asking for your help in what to say and what, it, what not to say. Lord, I've got some things I want to say. And if I'm not supposed to say it, then make my mouth shut up. I want to honor you and bring glory to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now here's what I want to say to you first. We are not done driving out our enemies. I, in my life, I am not done driving out my enemies. My enemies are threefold. Lust of the flesh, and I have it. Lust of the eyes and pride of life. That's me. I have those enemies yet before me. I am not perfect. I will never be perfect. I, but I am striving against those enemies that are still yet before me to be defeated. Now, and the same goes for all of you. You're not done driving out your enemies, are you, Brian? You're not done. Courtney, you're not done driving out your enemies. You want me to pick some other names? John, you're not done. Peter, you're not done driving out your enemies. Roy, you're not done. Now, some of you, I know what some of your enemies are because you told me. I haven't told anybody else. But you told me. And I know what they are. And I promise you, I will help you drive out those enemies. I am not going to turn my back on you. I won't do it. There have been some people that have pulled out of here. They're not going to help you. What they've said to this church is, you do it on your own, we're done. Okay. But we're, we've got the enemies to deal with and we're going to face them. I'm not going to back down. But be sure your sin will find you out. Take your Bible, turn to Leviticus chapter 1. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is don't look at the clock. Don't look. If I catch him by looking at it, I'm going to tell Michael to reach down there and grab it and pull it out of here. You know, we just look at our phone then. Okay. You get your phone out and play with it all you want to. I'm going to preach the word of God. Dinner will wait. 
Amen? Thank you. You got to leave them here. We got to keep, keep them here. Um, let me say this. Let me tell you who you're sitting in a room with. Drunks. And there's more than one. Drug addicts. You're sitting in a room with them. Adulterers. You're sitting in a room with them. People that's hooked on porn. You're sitting in a room with them. Liars. Thieves. You're sitting in a room with them. But they don't want to be drunks anymore. They don't want to be liars. They don't want to be thieves. They don't want to be hooked on anything. They don't want drugs anymore. But until, until you have walked in their shoes, you have no right to judge them. You have no right. If you've never had to struggle with any of those things. Then maybe your sin is pride of life. I've never done that. You don't get it then. Now here's the message. I'm, pre I'm not preaching. Oh, let's praise these people. And let's be happy. Because I'm going to tell you something. This is a warning. Be sure your sin will find you out. Because people have sat in church and then done things secretly thinking they got away with it and they always, God always finds a way to reveal what they did. Now, that's not the message. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of your herd and of the flock. And if this offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. And he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. When he put his hand, here's a man, here's a man and he's got his county fair prize goat or lamb. This lamb has won awards now at the county fair. It is the fairest and the best lamb he's ever had. It's worth, it's worth a thousand dollars. And he's got a rope around its neck. And him and his children are walking to the, to the tabernacle. Daddy, why are we taking this, why are we taking this lamb? What are we doing? Just wait a minute, children, and I'll explain it to you. So they get to the door of the tabernacle, and there's a Levite priest standing there. The man, according to the law, has to put his hands on the head of that lamb, that prized, expensive lamb. The children loved that lamb. They named it Mabel. That's Mabel. Daddy. What are you doing? I'm putting your sins on this lamb. Taking my family's sins and I'm putting it on this lamb. The Levite priest then takes the lamb inside the tabernacle. It's got a big curtain around it. So you can't see what's going to happen in there. There's a real neat message about that. It's about how they couldn't see the sacrifice. They couldn't see the cross. They didn't understand. It was all veiled. But then when Christ did it, it's open. You understand who that lamb is, right? 
So the kids are standing outside there and they, Mabel's being taken in. Daddy, what's, what's going to happen to Mabel? And then pretty soon they hear the cry of the lamb. As the priest slits the lamb's throat, drains the blood out of that lamb to kill it. And they're hearing the cry of that lamb. Daddy has to tell his children. Children, listen to me. Your mom and dad have done things that are wrong. And you children, you've done things that are wrong. And God told us to take all of our sins and put it on Mabel. Mabel's never done anything wrong, but we have to take our sins and lay it on Mabel. And the cry that you heard was the priest slaughtering Mabel. And Mabel has to be burnt on the altar. Because we sinned. He said it again in verse 10. It is a male without blemish, and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward. Before the Lord, because God's at the north, right? Ezekiel 1 tells us that. And the priest and Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar, and he shall cut into it his pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. They took the best lamb that that family had, and they slaughtered it. It cried out, and they cut it up in pieces and laid it on the altar before the Lord. Daddy, why do we have to do that? Daddy says, because sin always has a price to pay. Doesn't it? I want you to ask the question to yourself, what does is, what is your sin cost you? How much money have you had to put out? For your sin. How much gambling money have you wasted? How much money buying dirty magazines? How much money have you put out on cigarettes and liquor? Would you spend for that bag of marijuana? Or that heroin? Or that cocaine? How much is your sin cost you? Turn to Deuteronomy 28. Verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes which I have commanded thee this day. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Nobody in this church has ever kept all of God's ordinances. Nobody has. Who are you to look down your nose at somebody in God's house? Who are you to do that? So what does your sin cost you? God said, if you don't do all these things, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Who wants to go live up north St. Louis? Who wants to live in rural Jefferson County where they'll shoot you for getting too close to their meth lab? Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Our cities are cursed, amen. Guys going in Walmart just shooting up everybody. Mass killings everywhere. They said last night, they, watching the news, they said some organization come out, 200 and some odd mass killings in this country. All in the cities. What is that costing us in police and judges and courts and investigations? Cursing shalt thou be in the field. God said, I'm going to curse your field. You're going to lose your crops. Cursed shalt thou be in thy basket and thy store. 
Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and of the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind. The fruit of your body is your children. <laughs> My children have had their lives destroyed. Because of their mom and dad. There are things I wish I'd never done. My sin, my wife's sin, visited on our children. I'm not the only one, am I? Look at what it's cost us. Look at what it's cost us. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Look at what sin has cost our church. What's it cost us? Thou shalt send upon thee cursing. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke. And all that thou settest thine hand unto, unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 30. I want you to look in your Bible. Look at verse 30, guys. Look at it. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man lie with her. If I was mean, I'd ask you to raise your hand. I won't do that. Thou shalt build a house. Thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes thereof. The vineyard is your family and your church. And I'll say this, your sin, let me say it this way. How many of you love Bethel Church? Your sin will cost you your church. God will put you out. Do you believe the word of God today? Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes. Thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Your kids... Your grown kids, not even in church. Or they're going to some liberal seeker church, not hearing nothing. Your children were given to another people. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. There should be no might in thine hand. That's what sin does. It destroys families it destroys a marriage it destroys friendships 
brotherhood. And I feel today, I think we're all just loving one another. It feels good, doesn't it? Your sin will take that away. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. What's happening to America? Who owns, who owns America? China. Russia. Middle East nations. Muslims. We're not a nation that serves God anymore. We've lost that. To other people who are godless. We've lost it because of our sin. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight. You're crazy. You, it makes you so upset. It just, not, it just knocks your mind out. You're crazy. So be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot and to the top of thy head. I'm not one of these that says that you got, you got disease in you because you got sin. If you get rid of the sin, God will get rid of the disease. I'm not one of those that's that. But I would tell you something. Your body's got disease because you're a sinner. That's what the Bible says. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but thou shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You read Joel chapter 1, you'll understand those worms, caterpillars. The worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with oil. For thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but they shalt, thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Some of you, your children in bondage. Your adult children are in bondage, you're in captivity. And you cannot enjoy a relationship with them because of it. And all thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall thou locust consume. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. And he shall lend to thee, but thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Now, turn to Joshua chapter 7. This is where I'm going to end the message. You hang on, it's going to get rough. Now I want you to think to yourself for a minute what your sin cost you. Uh, Joshua chapter 7 verse 19. God had, God had made instructions. Listen now. Hey, listen. God had given instructions to, to Joshua, to all the people of Israel. When you go in Jericho, don't touch your stuff. It's cursed. I don't want to see anybody taking anything out of Jericho. I don't want to see it. Better not happen. That was a commandment that God told Joshua. Joshua tell him, when you go in Jericho, you're going to see all kinds of stuff. Don't touch it. Keep your hands off of it. It's cursed. Now, I don't fully understand all that, but I'm just, I do trust God. God said, don't do it. You don't do it. So a man named Achan. Fighting a battle for the Lord, right? He's a member of the church of Joshua. He goes running in Jericho. Walls falling down. He's seen the miracle of God. Now, I want you to understand this. There was a sinner in Jericho by the name of Rahab. She was a slut harlot. Right? Wore short dresses. Skimpy outfits. So men would look at her body and lust after her. And then she would invite them in, have sex with them for money. She was a whore. But she wanted to be saved. She wasn't the... Achan wasn't the only sinner. But one wanted out. And you know what God did with that? You know what God did with Rahab? What did God do with Rahab? She married a fellow and became the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine old Rahab... She's 90 years old, and she's looking at her great-great-granddaughters and telling them, you better dress right, 
in front of men. Don't you wear them clothes, you teenage girls. Don't you wear them skimpy clothes. Because I'm telling you, that life is the worst life in the world to live. So you young girls, don't you do that. You boys, don't you be looking at them girls that way. Don't you be doing that. This, this Rahab, the harlot, who knows the life and is telling her great-great-grandchildren, don't do that! So there's Achan. He goes in and he sees some stuff. And he takes it. Now there's sin in the camp because he went and took it home and buried it. Well, I mean, ask the question, what good is all that stuff if you've got to hide it all the time? I mean, the moment he comes out wearing that Babylonish coat, everybody's going to go. Where'd you get that? They're going to know. They're going to know where he got it. So Joshua goes out, fights a battle, gets slaughtered. Now you listen to me. Church, Bethel Church, listen to me. Your sin, it hurts this church. And I'm getting to the point I can't take it no more. It hurts me when you do wrong. Now, I'm not judging you because I do stuff and I just, uh, but I'm telling you, it's hurting your church. So they found Achan, they cast lots, they found it out who was Achan. So verse 19, Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Now, here's, here's where your mind goes. You get tempted with something, devil's going, go ahead and do it. You can get forgiven later. Am I right? Go ahead and do it. God will forgive you. Joshua's telling Achan to give glory and make confession. But here's what happened to Achan. Make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan... Now, I'm going to say this to you. And I want to lay the record straight. Some people in this church have done wrong. There are certain cases where I found out about it. And I've had to go to people like the Bible says. So let me, let me just bring a, let me bring a, a situation up. It, I, this didn't happen, but I'm going to make it up. Maybe it did. I don't know about it, but I'm going to make this one up. Let's say that, let's say that somebody in this church went and got some cocaine, snorted cocaine, and I found out about it. What I do then is I go to that person, like the Bible says, and I say to them, that was wrong and you know it. And they say back to me, yeah, I know it was. I'm sorry. I just, I was tempted. I just, I don't want to do that. Can I be forgiven? Yes, you can be forgiven. And we'll pray. We'll ask God to forgive you. And God forgives them. Now, let me tell you something. According to the Bible, it ends right there. It is not for public display nor public gossip and I am telling you as your pastor right now what I have known and heard about was dealt with and it's over but then some people Decided that they would tell everybody else what they heard about somebody. That's more wicked than that. Am I right? What, you think I just let everybody do whatever they want to do? I'm, I'll just sit there and keep my mouth shut? 
Now, there may be somebody sitting here that went, oh man, I snorted cocaine, oh my goodness, he knows. Let me tell you something. If you went to God by yourself and dealt with it, it's done right there. And I won't have it any other way here. And if you snorted cocaine, I hope God kicked your butt up to your shoulder blades. It's the first time I've ever said butt in a sermon. First time. But I'm, listen, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the gossip. I'm sick of the backstabbing. I've had all I'm going to take of it. Let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you what I got in mind. I've already asked some people about this. And they're going to help me out. I'm going to make a video. And I'm going to put some of the people in this church on it. Who are going to say on camera. I've been a drunkard. I've been a dope addict. I ruined my marriage. I was hooked on porn. I've done all these terrible things, but I come to Jesus, and he's forgiven me, and I go to Bethel Church. So, if I come to you and ask you to be on it, don't get mad at me. Because I want you on it. I want to reach out. To some drunkards. I want to reach out to some dope addicts. A couple years ago. Before I had back surgery. I was taking 10 pain pills at a time. Just to relieve the pain. And then I'd run out and I'd be a miserable, miserable person. It's a true story. When I had the back surgery, that relieved the pain. But I had to get off of those pain pills. It's the first time I've ever said that publicly. So I'm telling you, some of you, I know how you feel. I know what it's like. And what it's cost me. I don't even want to get into it. So, if you can handle that, me being your pastor, I'll keep doing it. But let me finish this story. Before you run me out. Look at what Joshua said. He said, he called Achan. He said, my son, look at that. I've had to go to my own children and say to my children, you're not doing right. My daughter, my son, you're not doing right. I give, pray, I pr- give, I pray thee, glory to God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done, and hide it not from me. Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, took, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, and fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and be- behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent. Behold, it was, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. Uh, I'm going to throw this in too. The process is, you, if you don't go to God with your sin, it's over with. If somebody has to come to you, God's going to send them to you because they know about it and they're going to deal with you and they're going to say, will you, will you repent? And if they repent, it's over with. If they don't, then a second person, two witnesses have to come and sit down with him and say, Look, we're begging you. We love you. We want you to come. We are sinners too. We want you to come to repentance. And if they won't do it, then it's got to come here in front of everybody. 
and everybody in the church is going to know what you did. Now, normally, most people run out and they never come back because they're not going to deal with that. And that's happened recently. But this is what Achan had to deal with. So they, watch this, verse 23. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, brought them unto Joshua and all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold. Look at this. And his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. Underline that in your Bible. All that he had. And they brought it them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned it with stones and burned it with a fire. Here's Achan. And he thinks that if, if he just confesses that he alone will be the one, only one to suffer. So he confesses. But Joshua gets his wife and his children. And his children are crying, Daddy, what, why are they doing this to us? It's because I sinned. And Achan stands there and watches while his children are bashed in their skulls with stones. He's watching his wife get killed. And the last thing that he sees is his family suffering for his sin. Sin has such a high, terrible price to it. You, you parents who still have your young children at home. Listen to your preacher. Your darling children are going to suffer for your sins. And you're going to have to watch it happen. God's going to let you live long enough for you to see your children and your sins taken out on them. That is a terrible price to pay. Maybe, maybe, even in that, God will show forth His mercy. If we will cry out to God for His mercy, for our sins, if we will do that. So this morning, I'm going to invite the drunks, the dopers, the adulterers, the liars, the cheaters, the thieves, the gossipers, the judges. I'm going to invite you all to come and cry for God's mercy. And we're going to put all the drunks right here and all the drug addicts there. And I want all the lot. No, we're not going to do that. That way we can identify who's who. You folks online. You folks online. If you're guilty of what these people are guilty of. You get out on your knees before God and you do it right now. And some of you folks online, if you've listened to some of the stupid gossip that's come out of the judgmental knuckleheads that left this church, you repent of that too. Because I guarantee you, 
It's been dealt with and forgiven and it's done. And the rest of it is none of your business. God said so. I stand by my church. And I will not run away from you even when you do wrong. I will not leave you. Father, I come to you this morning. Uh, God, I didn't intend to say some of the things I said, but you told me to say it. I have been where some of these people have been. I know the hell that their lives have endured. And Father, in that law, when that, when that Levite priest took that, that Mabel, that lamb, in the law, the priest had to take part of Mabel as he cut her up, he had to take, or him, he had to take part of that lamb and offer a sacrifice for his own sin first. Before he was even qualified to offer the sin for that family. And Father, that's me. I call upon you, God. For all the sins of my past. I thank you God that you have given me victory. Great victory. In my life. I'm not perfect. But I am not the man that I used to be. And I have you to th thank for that father. I thank you for coming to me Holy Spirit. And talking to me about my stupidity and about my sins. And I thank you, God, for having mercy on me. And Father, I pray for these that have come this morning. I ask you, God, to forgive them of their sins. Wipe away the stain of their guilt. And Father, give them a new conscience. So that when they rise up from this place today, they know that their sins have been forgiven. And they stand before you as their judge, righteous. And it does not matter what anybody else says. They are clean and forgiven. Father, I love this church. I thank you for it. I needed this weekend, God. I thank you, Lord, for bringing our friends here. We had good fellowship. We had a good time. We're going to enjoy some good food. But Father, I thank you, God, for ending this whole weekend this way today. Now we're all clean. Now we're all the same. Sinners saved by grace. Father, we love you for that. And to you and you alone, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And all of God's people said... Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning.